Um, I'd like us just to turn to Ephesians chapter 2 before we go any further tonight. Ephesians chapter 2. Bearing in mind, always remember this. The writer of Ephesians did not want to take the gospel to the Gentiles at all. He wanted to be the kingpin in Jerusalem and be the king teacher there. The next rabbi, great rabbi. That's what he wanted to be. But the Lord said, you are my chosen vessel to the Gentiles. And he went on three missionary trips all around uh, Eastern Europe. And on his third missionary trip, which was Tabernacles time, he said, I must go back to Jerusalem to keep the feast. Well, you can imagine it, can't you? We looked this morning at the fact that the Feast of Tabernacles is about bringing the Gentiles in. And Paul would be going back to Jerusalem basically saying, the call that God has put on me is fulfilling the purpose of tabernacles. He's coming back for tabernacles to celebrate it. And he's telling them all, Gentiles are coming in from everywhere. What a marvelous uh, fulfillment or partial fulfillment of the Feast of Tabernacles. So this is Paul. And we've just done this in the house groups together. And I'd like us just to um, uh, read together until we get down to verse 14. Ephesians 2, 1 to 14. And you be made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. Verse six. <coughs> and raised us up together, and made us to sit together in the heavenly places of Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we should walk in them. Therefore, remember that you, which Gentiles of the flesh, mm -hmm. who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made of the flesh by hand, that in that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no oath and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, yep. who has made both one, and mm. has broken down the middle wall of separation. Incredible. Um, yeah, I always, I always think with Ephesians, we read it, and it's so lovely, it's such a lovely letter, but it doesn't really fully sink in what we have been brought into and what Christ has done. So we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 23 and we're going to pick up. Um, this is one of those teachings, it is a bit like a lasagna and you do learn it in layers. One layer and then another layer and then another layer. And, and it takes time for it to sink in. And, and nobody, it, it, it hasn't sunk in fully this side of the Jordan. It can't because it's describing heaven. But we're going to look at it again. I want to show you some incredible things in the scripture. But Leviticus chapter 23, we'll, we'll just do a small recap here. So verse 39 
Also it says, on the 15th day of the 7th month, that's the 15th of Tishri. We talked about that this morning, didn't we? That's the beginning of this great feast, the feast, the feast of joy, the feast of booths, the feast of the ingathering, the feast of nations, so many names. It's like a diamond that you put up to the light with many colours that sparkle through. So on the 15th of the 7th month, you... When you have gathered in the fruit of the land. And again, you see the booth there with all the fruit on. That's something that they were told to do in the Talmud and in the Mishnah. To hang lots of fruit from your booth and and to stay outside for seven days. And um, he says, when you've gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. And on the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest. And on the eighth day, which we looked at, remember we looked, we'll look at it just again a little bit. We call that day Simhat Torah, the rejoicing over the Torah, on the eighth day of Sabbath rest. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and the willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And I showed you this morning, I'll just show you again very quickly. This is something called the lulav. And this is what they would do. They would bring this to the booth. So the palm in the middle there is supposed to represent a man's spine. The willows are supposed to represent the lip. The, uh, the, the myrtle is supposed to represent the eye. It's supposed to be the whole person is brought before God. And we, they, they would face east, which is that way. And they would worship the Lord by waving it towards the east and waving it towards every corner of the earth. And as they do this, they'd worship God and proclaim that the rains would fall, not just on those, but also on the Gentiles. Which they would have trouble doing that, actually. Because they didn't really like the Gentiles that much. But nevertheless, they knew that the God that loved and had called them has also called the Gentiles. Bearing in mind, folks, that Israel was called to be a light to the Gentiles. And they didn't realize at that time that that light would be Christ himself. They thought it was going to be them. But ultimately, it would be Christ himself that would be that light. So there they are. Uh, proclaiming blessing over the four corners of the earth, up to the Lord, down into the valleys. And that's what they do every day in the booths. And they would go in the booths and they would show the children how to look at the leaves and how withered they are and to tell them that even as a teenager, um, it it looks as though you've got your whole future ahead of you, but life is over in a flash. We all know that. And just as the flower withers, we wither. And of course, when you're telling that to teenagers, they just look at you and say, whatever. But but then you tell them, but the word of the Lord's Son remains forever. And uh, there is something about these object lessons and uh, being able to see things visibly, uh, like Passover, and the children would gather around. There is something about that, that it goes in deeper. It goes in on a deeper level. But all of these things are entrenched in the love of God. They all point to Jesus Christ. Every single one of them fully point to him. Remember, the word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. So we're moving towards Halloween, right? You've all seen it. The shops are full of it. Hate Halloween. I've, I've always hated Halloween. I hate Halloween. I'm not even keen on the Christian light thing because I still think that gives glory to Halloween. So you've got this Halloween thing and then you've got Christmas. Now I'm not having a go here folks, I'm not coming down on Christmas. Um, I like Christmas, I like being with the family and I'm not going to say that I don't. But let's just be aware that it's totally pagan. Christmas is totally pagan, and it was, it was, it's really about the winter, winter solstice. That's what it's about. I'm glad we've got it, because it'd be miserable if we didn't have Christmas, to be honest. Dark, winter, yeah, horrible. So I'm glad there is something 
But it's got nothing to do with Christ. Christ was born at Tabernacles. The Word became flesh and tabernacled amongst us. Jesus was born in the autumn feasts. The Lord said, I will give him to you in the former and the latter reigns. He's coming. And he came in the and he's coming in the latter reigns, former and latter reigns. He was born at Tabernacles. So why are we doing this? Why make such a thing of it? Because this is when Christ was born. And uh, he wasn't born in, on December the 25th. Now we'll, we'll give it a good go again this Christmas, I'm sure. But we're fighting the losing battle, folks, because we won't be celebrating Christmas in heaven. <clears throat> Is that depressed you at all? Do you, do you know what, folks? Honestly, perhaps one day in heaven, when we're decorating our booths with fruit, right, and we're comparing our booth to the person next door, we'll finally get it, eh? Because we will celebrate tabernacles in heaven. The Gentiles will celebrate tabernacles. So it says, you shall dwell in booths. And I love it. I, I just, I, you know I do. I love being outside. And I thought it was very special on Friday night. Because we had the stars were out. Now, you say, oh, that's nothing. Well, part of tabernacles was to leave... Uh, the, the ceiling open so that you could see the stars. How many times do you get clear nights in, in, in England? But the stars were out all night Friday night, which was fantastic. You shall dwell in booths for seven days, and all who are native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. And that's what it's about. I said this morning, it's not just about harvest. The harvest festivals, they're lovely. But we have more than a harvest festival. We celebrate the fact that we have been released from the power of Satan through the blood of Jesus. It's more than just a harvest festival. The Canaanites all celebrated harvest festivals. All of them did. What set the Israelites apart is they... They rejoiced in the fact that they've been set free. And when the Son of Man has set you free, you'll be free indeed. Now then, now this is where you've got to just watch, okay? We're now moving from Leviticus 23 to 24. So we're going to be paralleling this up with John 7 and John 8. Leviticus 23 parallels John chapter 7. And Leviticus chapter 24 parallels John chapter 8. Okay? We'll get to it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. And if it goes over your head, don't worry. Because it's still washing you. <laughs> Leviticus 24. Then the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. Isn't that incredible? John chapter 7 is all about Jesus fulfilling the Feast of Tabernacles, right? John chapter 8, it begins with Jesus coming down from the Mount of Olives. Leviticus 24, it says... Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of olives for the light. Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives to proclaim himself in John chapter 8 to be the light of the world. And it goes on. It says, to make the lamps burn continually. Outside the veil of testimony, in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge from evening until morning before the Lord continuing. And it shall be a statute forever in your generations. And he shall be in charge of the lamps on pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. He says, you shall take fine flour and bake twelve cakes with it. The flour, particularly fine flour... Always, always speaks of the word of God. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Fine flour always speaks of the word. 
Two tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on a pure gold table. Now there's a lampstand, and it's illuminating these cakes. Now, in the New Testament point of view, Jesus is the lamp, and he illuminates the word. Is everybody with that? He's illuminating the word. And then you shall pour pure frankincense on each row. Frankincense always speaks of worship. Always speaks of worship. So you have a picture here of Jesus who is the light of the world. He is shining light onto the word. Yes, this book is a dead book if the Holy Spirit doesn't speak to you through it. But when you're born again of the incorruptible seed of the word of God, he will speak to you through the word by the Spirit. So, Jesus is the light. He shines illumination onto the word. He promised that in the Gospel of John, that he would teach us all things. The Holy Spirit would show us. He would illuminate the word. It's when we have illumination on God's word that you really begin to enter into the frankincense, the worship. Are you with that? It's always the same in the Bible. It's always that way. Sometimes, and I feel it sometimes on a Sunday morning, we rush into worship. We're not ready. We're not actually ready to worship. And it's all kind of like changing gear on an old 1980s motor. <laughs> oh, there we are. We're in. You know, and it, it can be like that. But there is a procedure that helps us to move into God's presence so that we can move into that place of worship. And by the way, we don't just worship God in spirit. We worship him in spirit and thy word is truth. Thy word is truth. It's a combination of the two. And once you've got that combination, things can really start to happen. It's a great shame today that we are moving away from the word. You look at worship songs today, come on, we've all noticed it. Poor folks that have to do worship have noticed it. The, the more we go on, the less of the word there is in the word we're departing from the word. And you, I mean, Mandy told me about Hills. I didn't know about Hills songs. But you've got, at the moment now, you've got two gay men doing worship in Hills songs. Apparently they were kissing one another. Is that right? They were kissing one another. Because when you depart from the word, it isn't long, folks, before all kinds of stuff starts to come in. We don't just worship God in spirit. We worship God in spirit and in truth. And that's why. There is an anointing on the, the old hymns. There really is on some of these old hymns. There's such an anointing on them. Yeah, and I, you know, I love, I love all kinds of worship. I genuinely do. Um, and there are some very, very simple, simple songs that are so, so beautiful and profound. But they follow the word. They follow the word. It's the word that pierces our hearts, even when we, when we worship. Now, something strange happens here. So bearing in mind Leviticus 24, you see this pure olive oil. John 8, Jesus comes down from the Mount of Olives. On the last day, the eighth day of this feast... He comes down from the Mount of Olives to proclaim himself to be the light of the world. But then there's a real problem. In John 7, John 8 and John 9. They're all gravitating around the Feast of Tabernacles. Like a great galaxy with Christ at the core of it. It's all going round. And there's trouble because... This is an itinerant preacher from Galilee with no qualifications whatsoever. And 
as we saw this morning, this feast was enormous. The expense that they went to was colossal. The lampstands that they made, that Herod made for the temple were three stories high. The oil was five and a half gallons of olive oil for each lamp. They used the old priestly garments as uh, wicks to burn the lamps. And so at night time, it was spectacular. Light could be seen streaming all around Jerusalem in every way, shape or form. To have this procession with the, with the willows as they marched up, whistling these, these willows around with flutes playing and people singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And to have the priests coming up with a golden bowl of water and pouring it out. And as he poured it out, the people would say, therefore you will uh, draw water with joy from the wells of salvation. And that was what was happening. As he was pouring it out, they were saying those things. And the other third of the priests were putting the sacrifices upon the altar as a burnt offering for the Lord. And as this was happening, this itinerant preacher from Galilee that was not part of the in crowd whatsoever stands there and has the audacity to proclaim himself to be God. And it just stunned them. Because, and you'll get this in a minute, if he wasn't, then this is blasphemy and he deserved to be stoned to death. Quite rightly so. For anybody to say, I am the light of the world. For anybody to say, come to me and out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. To say that when you are not him is pure blasphemy. And it, and it would have been proper, totally right, to have stoned him. But they didn't. And they couldn't. In Luke chapter 4, when he proclaimed, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me, he's anointed me to bring the good news. They tried to push him over a cliff, like the scapegoat at Yom Kippur. They tried to, they couldn't do it, because his time had not yet come. And no matter what they tried to do, they could not kill him before the chosen time that the Father had prescribed for him. Even Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane prayed when he was under such terrible pressure, he prayed, take this cup away from me. And the father wouldn't listen to that prayer because there was a higher purpose of Christ's death. People wonder why there's suffering in the world. The only answer that I can think of is that when God doesn't answer our prayers, there must be a higher purpose for the suffering. And we don't know what it is a lot of the time. But if there's a higher purpose, which there was with Jesus, and he said, Father, take this cup away from me, but there's a higher purpose, son. I can't do it. So nothing would stop Christ from going to the cross. And they tried to kill him at Feast of Tabernacles because it was their thing. It cost a lot of money to put these things on. Uh, and the organization was impeccable. I, I think I told you this morning. These things here are inspected with a tiny magnifying glass. If there's so much as a blemish on them, you can't use them. They have to be perfect. They're about 55 quid to buy. Uh, for that. They know how to make money, these people. <laughs> now, this, now listen, this is, this is important now. So we've just looked at Leviticus 24. We can see how it fits John 8. Now watch. Verse 10. Now the son of an Israelite woman, okay, so this son had a Jewish mother whose father was an Egyptian, okay, so there's a son here with an Israelite mother whose father is an Egyptian. Went out among the people of Israel and the Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other in the camp. The Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed so that they brought him to Moses. 
his mother's name I'm not going to bother pronouncing verse 12 then they put him in custody that the mind of the Lord might be shown to him and the Lord spoke to Moses and said take him outside the camp take outside the camp him who has cursed then let all who heard him lay their hands on his head and uh, verse 15 then you shall speak to the children of Israel saying whoever curses his God shall bear his sin and whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death and all the congregation shall certainly stone him so in Leviticus 24 there's a case of a Jew who had a Jewish mother but an Egyptian father blaspheming God and because he was blaspheming God they stoned him now bear in mind we looked at this this morning when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments written by the finger of God and they saw the Israelites and what they were doing Moses smashed the commandments and they would have just been bits of stone now in essence when a person was stoned it was like because they broken the law the broken parts of the law were stoning them to death it's literally like having the book thrown at you you broke the law therefore the law is going to stone you so here is a man who has a Jewish mother whose father's an Egyptian that's blaspheming God and deserves to be stoned. Everybody got that? Yeah. Right. So let's turn to John chapter 7 then. <clears throat> we'll get straight to it. Now there's already rumblings, huge rumblings in John 7. No, I need to read, just let me read this for the, for the context, for those that weren't here this morning. John 7 verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. That's the context of John 7, John 8, and even John 9. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, because they were in Galilee, that your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. And if you do these things, show yourself to the world. For even his brothers did not believe him. And Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always ready. There's a sermon in this alone. We're constantly trying to promote ourselves. God doesn't want us to do that. We don't need to promote ourselves. Uh, the things that you do in secret, you will be rewarded for openly in heaven. But when you promote yourself, you've already had your reward. And Jesus is saying, that's what you do, but that's not what I do. I am not going to that feast. If you wanted to be anybody, you got to that feast and you sold yourself. But he says, that's not my way and that's not the Father's way. I won't go and do that. They're basically saying to him, go and do the miracles that you've been doing in Galilee. They'll love you for it. Now then. So he comes in the middle of the feast as we see. He comes while they're pouring out the water on the altar. And they're saying, with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. He comes while they're wafting the willows over. And you see all these wonderful things happening. And he cries out with a loud voice, if any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now, this is important. At this point, what had he actually done to qualify being the person that he said he was at this point as he comes to the feast? Nothing really. Remember when the, I think it was um, Bob mentioned it this morning, when the, when the cripples lowered through the, the roof. The first thing Jesus says to him is, be of good cheer, your sins are forgiven. And they say, how dare you forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. And he says, well, just to prove to you who this is, pick up your mat and walk. So uh, up until this point, he'd made this proclamation, this declaration. I am the water, the living water. I am the mine Hayim, it's me. Everything that you've read about the Old Testament prophets, I am the former and the latter rains, it's me. I am the blessed one, it is me. I've arrived. But yet there was no miracles. 
Then later he would see this prostitute, this, sorry, not a prostitute, a woman who committed adultery. And of course, he, he, he was very gracious. He said some incredibly powerful words, but still no miracles. Still nothing to qualify. You know, what authority do you have? How dare you say you're the light of the world? Now we're moving towards an event where Jesus would qualify why he could say at the Feast of Tabernacles what he could say. So in Solomon's day, in Solomon's day, the temple was filled with the glory of God. But in Jesus' day, he superseded all of that. And in the days that we go into, no eye has seen and no ear has heard and no mind has conceived what God has prepared for us who love him. But we will go to this feast. Feast. Jesus loves feasts. I'll get to that when we come to the end. By the way, it wasn't a bad feast on Friday night, was it? I did enjoy that hot curry. I had it the next day as well. <clears throat> so, of course, Jesus cries out, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. Now let's go to John 8. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, what have we just read in Leviticus 24? Olive oil. Now early in the morning he came into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Why did he teach them? Because this was Simhat Torah. This is the day of the year. It's called the rejoicing over the Torah. This was the day that they rejoiced over the word of God. You know, Cliff gives out Gideon Bibles all around and... Can you remember the day when you took your Bible and you pressed it to your chest and you said, thank you, Lord, for my Bible. Thank you for giving me this. This means so much to me. It's the most precious thing I have. This is the number one way that God chooses to speak to us. And it's the plumb line of which everything else is judged by. Every prophecy, every tongue, everything that we do in the meeting is judged by the plumb line of the word of God. Amen. That's what, he tell, that's what Paul tells you. And let everything be done decently and in order. And if you're going to prophesy, know this. People will weigh it up. And they must because that's right. This is it. This is the word. So he taught the people. And we don't want that. We want this miracle maker going around doing miracles all the time. But he taught the people. Are you, is this ringing? I hope it is. I hope you can understand this. It's so important. We're going to spend a long time with Jesus. And he's going to be teaching us. So he's teaching the people on this precious day. And then the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. I mean, the whole thing was a setup. Of course it was. They hated him. Now in Moses' law commanded us that such a, a, a woman should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. Now have a look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. I will come straight back to this one verse. Jeremiah seventeen thirteen. O Lord, the hope of Israel, all who forsake you shall be ashamed. Those who depart from me shall be written in the earth, because they have forsaken the Lord, the fountain of living waters. He's just declared himself in the last chapter as the fountain of living waters, and now he's writing in the ground. Because these people 
have forsaken him. The irony is they think they're, they're the ones that are closest to God. So he stoops down and he writes in the ground. So we're back to John 8 now, John 8, 7. So they continued asking him, and he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. This was incredible. This is the inauguration of a new way. The woman should have been stoned. But because of grace, grace has superseded judgment. This woman is set free. And it happens on Simhat Torah, which is, the, which is the last reading of the old year and the first reading in the new year. So this would be Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created something new. You are a new creation. No more in condemnation. This happened on the eighth day. There were eight people in the ark. There are eight beatitudes. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Sunday is the eighth day. It's the day that the Lord rose from the grave. And he says, woman, where are your accusers? Where are they? And she says, there are none, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And he did say, go and sin no more. He didn't say, go back, you'll be all right from now on because you say, by grace. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Now, I know I said this this morning, but I know I went through it very, very quickly. You got these huge lamps burning so brightly. It was such a wonderful display. Jesus is basically saying, your lamps can't even hold up a candle to who I am. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Now then, in order to understand Leviticus 24, where we have a young man whose mother is Jewish, whose father is Egyptian, who has blasphemed and therefore must be stoned. I want us to read together John chapter 8, verse 13, all the way to 44. Can we read that together? John 8, 13, all the way to 44. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You bear witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered, said to them, Even if I bear witness of my soul, my witness is true. For I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. And yet if I do judge, my judgment is true. For I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of my soul, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Verse Thank you. 
Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants, and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever. Mm. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Verse 27. I know that you are able to understand this, but you seek to kill me, because my will is more faithful than you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, They promise us. You were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth, which I feared from God, Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your fathers. And they said to him, You will not call the fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, If God were your father, you would want me. For I have received call. Nor have I comfort of myself, but I thought he said to me, this way to do. Why do you misunderstand what I say? It is because you are unable to hear what I am saying. You are of your father, the devil, and it is your will to practice the lusts and gratify the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaks of falsehood, he speaks what is natural to him, or he is a liar himself, the father of lies, and the Lord of his Okay. Leviticus 24. There's a young man who has a Jewish mother, an Egyptian father, who blasphemes God and has to be stoned. John chapter 8. The Jews, the sons of Abraham, but Jesus said to them, your father is the devil. He's talking about a group here, not the Jews, but a group of the Jews. He says, your father is the devil. Can you see the parallels? Your father is the devil. I know you're sons of Abraham, but your father is the devil because you're liars. And in essence, the... Leviticus 24 is showing us these are the ones that should have been stoned. They dragged a woman to him to be stoned and according to their word, their own word, they should have been stoned. Do you get that? Incredible. Here's the most amazing thing. When Jesus is finally hanging off three nails upon the cross, uh, in utter shame but in complete control of everything and they're sneering at him the very people that in John 7 are trying to nail him constantly are sneering at him and they're enjoying every moment Jesus says the words Father forgive them these ones whose father is the devil he says Father forgive them they don't know what they do which takes us to Acts chapter 2 and these very people that constantly tried to murder him, that were glad to see him suffer an unimaginable death, end up getting gloriously saved as God 
pours out his Holy Spirit. I am sending him to you. I'm sending you the former rains and I'm sending you the latter rains. And the very people that hated him end up worshipping him. And Peter stands up and he says, I know you did this in ignorance. And God raised up these people that once hated him, that now love him. That's our God. That's our God. And he is the God of the feast. Now coming back to this, John chapter 8. So he's made these incredible uh, proclamations of who he is. But it's not until you get to John chapter 9, when he's in the temple again, and he sees a young man who is blind. And he tells him to go down to the pool of Siloam. And he goes down there and he takes some mud and he puts it on his eyes. And the young man can see. Back in Solomon's day, the glory of the Lord filled uh, the temple on the Feast of Tabernacles. In Jesus' day, he goes to a blind man and the blind man can see it. And it's a picture. It's a picture of what God's going to do with all the Jews. On the day of Pentecost, their eyes would be opened. That's what our God does. That's what he's in the business of doing. is opening the eyes of the blind, opening the ears of the deaf, causing us to walk and to leap and to praise God. That's our Messiah. And he's our Messiah. He's calling us from the north, from the south, from the east to the west. He's taken down the middle wall of partition and up these incredible feasts that I can't wait to celebrate. I can't wait. It's wonderful. Christmas can't hold up a candle to this stuff. It's incredible. We're going to, we're called into it. The wall's gone down and we're going to, can you imagine the worship in heaven? There'll be instruments in heaven that you didn't even know about. I'm, I'm pretty sure that in heaven there won't be seven notes. I'm pretty sure, you know, you get to the eighth uh, note and you're back to the start again. I am pretty sure when we get there, there will be extra notes, there'll be extra chords, there'll be instruments that we can't see, colours that we can't see. Everything uh, will be incredible. But the main thing is, it's not what we see, it's what we're going to experience. Imagine spending a night with Jesus underneath the stars, which the disciples did regularly. Imagine that. Just chilling out with Jesus and having a barbecue with him and listening to what he said and laughing with him and joking with him. He gave nicknames to the disciples. He's amazing. He's, there's nobody like him. And to say upon the cross, Father, forgive them. Forgive them. I know that they're but dust. It's incredible. Incredible. Well, of course, they say to the young man, give glory to God. Did, were you really blind? Was he really blind? Ask his mum and dad, was he really blind? Or was it, what's going on here? Was this a show? Is this man really blind? And he says, oh, I don't know. All I can tell you is, I was blind, but now I see. And that was it. You, there's no comeback from that. When somebody that's blind gets their eyes open, there's no comeback. Let's just turn um, to Revelation chapter 3, verse, Revelation 3. We are living in the church age of Laodicea. We are. The West is Laodicean. You know... Even if we have a Brexit, is it really going to change the spiritual state of this country? We need a revival, friends. Politics is not enough. Politics will never bring a revival. Never. Uh, thank God for coming out. We're all for it. I think everybody in the church is for it. But that's not going to bring a revival. To the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, people's opinions. That's what it means, isn't it? Well, I think this. Well, I think this. Well, I think this. These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. And this is to the church age. It's to the church 
across the board. He says, I know that you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And you don't know that you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind and naked. It sounds awful, doesn't it? I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. White garments that you may be clothed. Ephesians chapter 1, we looked at it last week. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. And Jesus wants us to lay hold of what he's given us. I counsel you to buy gold and get these things. Get them. That the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and to anoint your eyes with eye salve so that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chase, and therefore be zealous. Be at boiling point and repent. Here it is. This is our Lord. This is what he's all about. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He's the Lord of the feasts. He's the Lord of the feasts. All of the feasts. There's going to be a marriage supper of the Lamb. He's going to dine with us. He wants us to understand a, a, a Christianity on a completely different level. These feasts, I hope this came across today. These feasts are not just for the Jewish people. They're for us all. All of us. We're all going to celebrate these feasts. And we will one day know the joy of the 15th of Tishri. We'll know the joy of waving the lullaby before the Lord. Multitudes beyond number. Waving our palm branches before him. Salvation belongs to you, O Lord. Blessing and honour and glory and power be unto our God forever and ever. And we'll have an eternity to understand what Jesus means when he says, I will dine with you. We'll eat together. We'll eat together. That's the feasts. Praise God, eh? Amen.